So, the Trinity. We're transitioning now with Copeland into what is known as the imminent Trinity. There are two different ways of talking about the Trinity. The imminent, or it's sometimes called the ontological Trinity. This is God in God's relationship with God's self. The economic trinity is the trinity as it God relates to us. So it's the trinity in God's relationship with the world. The trinity in the economy of salvation. That's how you can remember economic. The economic trinity has to do with the economy of salvation. The imminent or ontological trinity has to do with God in God's self. Now, in the Nicene Creed, we get both trinities. We talk about both trinities at once, at the same time, all the time. This is just a way to distinguish them so that we can get our, it's a way to distinguish them from each other so that we can get our theological ideas straight. It's not that there are two sorts of trinities. It's not that there are two trinities. The imminent trinity over here and the economic trinity over here. They're the same trinity. This is just an analytic distinction so that we can kind of divide up the questions that we ask and so get our theological ideas straight, as I said. In any case, there are two different ways of talking about the trinity. So not two different trinities, but two different ways of talking about the trinity. The imminent and the economic. An example of the imminent trinity to talk about the imminent trinity is um, what we say at the beginning of the second article of the Nicene Creed, the one about Jesus. So we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made of one being with the Father. That's the imminent trinity. Then it goes on, through him all things were made. And you see how it ceases to be about the relationship with the Father and the Son and begins to be about the relationship of God with the world. Through him all things were made. Their creation comes in. Then for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man, etc. So the rest of that is about the economic trinity, about the trinity in God's relationship with the world. Does that make some sense? So theologians, in trying to get their ideas straight, have distinguished between God imminently and God economically. Thus far in the class, we have really only been looking at the economic trinity. Okay? And here's Copley's economic trinity, just to remind you. The Father, and through the Spirit, Incorporates us into the life of the Son, reconciling us with the Father. If you remember the Romans 8 thing, the Spirit, uh, when we cry, Abba, Father, it is, the, it is that Spirit praying with our Spirit that we are. Oh gosh, I got that first wrong. Like that <laughs> is that Spirit with our Spirit praying and showing us that we're children of God, something like that. Um, this is her economic trinity. It's the way that God relates to the world. So what she's trying to figure out is how God relates to God's self, if this is how God relates to the world. And you remember her difference, uh, the distinction she was trying to make between this sort of reflexive account of the trinity. You see how it kind of moves from the Father and the Spirit, and the Spirit returns to the Father through the Son. It has a kind of dynamism and movement to it versus the idea that she was saying she found in some Cappadocian theologians like Gregory of Nyssa, where the three Trinitarian persons were sort of in a line, and you uh, there was the delicious image of the chain, where you grab a hold of the Spirit, and then you climb up a little more, and then you get a hold of the Father, and then you pull down the chain a little more, and then you finally get a hold of the Son. But you're sort of leaving them behind as you do that. Right, so there's no, it's kind of a, it's a movement up, a procession up to the Father, rather than being incorporated in a 
into a mo Trinitarian movement, which is dynamic. And what we discussed last time is the way that this Trinitarian movement is ecstatic. So the question, again, is if this is the economic trinity that she wants, rather than this, what must God be like in God's relationships with God's self, if that's the case? The context for her articulation of this concern is the legendary debate over the filioque clause. Filioque means and the son. It's all about this one word in the third article of the Nicene Creed the one on the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, filioque, and the Son. Basically, the West says the Father and the Son. The East says the Father, no Son. So here are the basic pictures that you get. The East, the Father begets the Son, and the Father breathes the Spirit. So the Father is the source of both, and the Father, I hesitate to say produces or makes, because you can't say that. It's not a making, it's not a producing. That's why we say begotten, not made. Um, the Father is the source, the Father is the one from whom both the Son and the Spirit proceed without the involvement of the other person. So you get the image sometimes that the Son and the Spirit are like the two arms of the Father. It's just the Father doing two different sorts of things, but it's about the Father. So the Son is not involved in the Spirit's procession, which is different from the Western understanding which we currently recite in the version of the Nicene Creed in the 1979 prayer book. By the way, this is, a, this is a current debate in the Episcopal Church, whether or not to retain and the Son. So when we move forward with prayer book revision, and if you notice something changes, this is why. Because this is the, this is the, this is the origin of the great schism between East and West. As a Protestant tradition, we're Western, because we come from Roman Catholicism. Um, so that's why we've said and the son all the time. The Catholic Western view is, again, that the father begets the son. So the spirit's not involved in the son's begetting. But then the spirit, how do we do this? The spirit proceeds from both the Father, and the Son. So these are the differences. And it's all about this word, filioque, and the Son. Here's why that might matter. The Father being the sole source of both Son and Spirit would seem to say that the Father is more God than the Son and the Spirit. At least that's the suggestion. Of course you can't actually say that. That's not orthodox. So all none of these theologians are going to end up saying that the Father is more God than the Son and the Spirit. But Copley's point throughout this whole book has been that what theologians say they're doing is not always what they end up doing. And you can test this by looking at things like art, right? So no matter how much you say, God isn't a man. And of course, nobody believes that God is a man. Believes. If you still picture God as two men and a bird, it really doesn't matter what you have said you're doing. What matters is what you actually end up doing. So this is the argument with this, that what you actually end up doing is suggesting that the Father is more God than the Son and the Spirit, because the Son and the Spirit don't, um, 
there are no persons which proceed from the Son and the Spirit. They don't, oh, I can't say produce or make or cause. I can't say any of those words because that's not what it is. It's this technical term, proceed. Um, yeah, they're not. It, it does, it does the phrase, um, nothing proceeds from the Father, from the Son of the Spirit. Does that help? If you need to say, the Son and the Spirit don't ever produce anything. That, I mean, that's, that's kind of what I'm saying. Except we can't say the word produce. But, but here's the word proceed. Anyway. It suggests that the Father is more God than the other two. Now, the reason why you can't say make, I'm not just, I'm not just um, making, I'm not just trying to follow rules for the sake of following rules. You can't say produce or make, because that would suggest that the Son and the Spirit are creatures. God makes and produces us. God can't make and produce other, you know, members of the Trinity. That would suggest that they're creations of the Father, which is what Arius believed. So that's the reason why we say begotten, not made in the Greek. Is because Arius thought that the Son was created by the Father. We say that the Son is, be, is begotten by the Father. Nobody knows what that begetting is. Nobody knows what, be, what actually constitutes begetting. We just know it's not making. But it is something. In any case, that's the East. The West would seem to do a better job of maintaining the equality of the persons. Because it says that the Son is involved in the begetting of, or in the spirating, the breathing of the Spirit. But, Coakley says, that's too easy. That's actually an illusory equality. And she says everybody over the last, you know, couple of decades has been obsessed with this question, trying to reconcile East and West over this word. Figuring out whether or not the Son is involved in the procession of the Spirit. She says that if her book has taught us anything, it's that it is the Spirit who is the most marginalized person in the Trinity. And that this account of the Trinitarian processions marginalizes the Spirit as much as this does. Because over here, notice the Son is involved in the procession of a person, but the Spirit still is not. The Spirit is still third. The Spirit never sends forth anything from itself. So you get a functional hierarchy here too. Father one, Son two, Spirit three. Over here, you would still maybe get one, two, and three because the Father, it said, begets the Son before the Father breathes forth the Spirit. Of course, none of these terms actually make much sense because God is supposed to be eternal. So what does time mean? What does before and after mean if God's supposed to be eternally this way? But anyway, they still get in order, one, two, and three. But you could kind of say that, well, the Son and the Spirit are both kind of hung out to dry functionally with this. But with this one, with the Western one, you still get the Spirit in this third position. You still suggest the subordination of the Spirit to the Son and the Father. This is something that she doesn't want to do, because we want to say that the Trinity is a community of perfect love, that the Trinity has no hierarchy, that the Trinity has no subordination within it. What the Eastern cults end up doing is start talking about the monarchy of God the Father. <laughs> this is the, it's one of the ways that they talk about the fact that the Father is the source of both the Son and the Spirit. They call the Father a monarch. Mon, one, ark cause. Monarch. That would seem to be a, an understanding of the Spirit, the understanding of the Trinity, which isn't perfectly equal. And that's what, at the end of the day, we want. So, she says it's an adventure and missing the point. What she should really be focused on is how to fix the Spirit. Is the Spirit involved in the possession of a person? If you do that, then you might fix not only this question, but you might throw the Trinity as a whole into new, more equal relief. Here's what she proposes.
So she keeps something like the Western understanding of the possession of the Spirit. She says the Spirit proceeds from the Father. and or through the Son. Through, I think, is where she actually comes down on this. And through has been a popular solution to the filioque problem. They say, well, instead of saying and, why don't you say through? And that seems to, in some cases, that reconciles um, folk coming from both, both east and west. What Coakley ends up saying, Coakley's solution to this, is that the, she says the Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son. So she basically keeps the Western thing. What she says about the Son, though, is that the Son is begotten by the Father in the Spirit. So the Spirit now had something to do in the possession of the Son. And the Father receives back from the Spirit and the Son its identity as Father. Can there be a Father without a Son? No. You don't pre-exist as a Father, and then you have a kid after there's a kid born. This is the reason... Why this is one of the reasons why these um, why the analogy of father and son was used for the Trinity in the beginning is because you can't have a father without a son. There could be no son without a, who doesn't have a father. That's so the the let me think about this down before I forget I said. The Trinitarian persons are nothing but relations. That's all that they are. They're just relations. The Father is not a person like us who precedes her fatherness. There's no person behind fatherhood. The Father is just fatherhood. That's it. The Son is just sonship, childhood. That's it. And the spirit is just being breathedness. I don't know, something like that. Or uh, love, something like that. Uh, Augustine says that the spirit is the love shared between the Father and the Son. There's nothing to the Trinitarian persons other than their relationships with each other. This is one of the ways that you are able to assert their difference from each other and also their unity at the same time. And to assert them by virtue of the same statement. When you say there's nothing but fatherhood to the father, there's nothing but sonship to the son, then you need them both together, precisely in order to articulate their difference from one another. The son is really different from the father because the son is not a father. The son is just a son. The father is different from the son because the father is just a father, not also a son. But you, they need each other. You cannot think them outside of each other because unlike us, when we become parents, there is nothing to God other than these relationships to one another. That is how Coakley says the Father is not simply a source as we normally think of it. It is not as if the Father exists at noon and then at ten past he begets the Son and then at fifteen past he breathes forth the Spirit. It can't work like that. Because there is no father before there is a son. Does that make some sense? There can be no father before there's a son, because there's nothing to the father other than the father's fatherness. So the father must receive back from the persons who proceed from 
her the person that she is. And this all happens in one eternal moment of ecstasy. It looks something like this. This was our imminent trinity. The, I mean, I'm sorry, this was our economic trinity. This was God's relationship with us. Something like this is just God's relationship with God's self. I don't quite know how to draw this picture. But it's something like, oh, the Father begets the Son in the Spirit, and the Spirit is proceeding from the Father through the Son. I don't know how to do that. We would like have to, I don't know, change the color, like you foreground one and put one in the background. I'm not sure how to do that. And then the Father receives its personality, its personhood, from the fact that there is a Son and the Spirit. So all three persons are involved at every single step of the way. Now that you start out with Father, and then you have Father and Son, and then you get Father and Son and Spirit. That's the Western version. It's also not as if you have Father, then you have Son, and then you go back to the Father and you have Spirit over here. That's the Eastern version. It's that at the very beginning, the Father begets the Son and the Spirit, the the Father begets the Spirit through the Son, and the Father is only a Father because the Father receives back its status as a parent from the Son and the Spirit. All this has to happen eternally, right at once, forever, in order for it to work. But you see how I was forced, when I was articulating that understanding of the Trinity, to say all three Trinitarian persons at every single step of the way. Coakley says that's what theologians ought to be worried about, rather than worry simply about whether or not the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, or just from the Father. This would not only provide a better understanding of the full divinity of the Spirit, which has been our concern in this book, but it might also open up new possibilities for ecumenical dialogue in order to say, you know what, both East and West have a problem, and that problem is the Spirit. Let's fix that, and we might fix what the, what separates us at the same time. So, now we have to talk about whether or not a feminist can call God Father. This should be rather quick. What you do when you pray is you enter into the dialogue of God with God's self. We talked about this before. This is the Romans 8 thing. When we say, Abba, when we cry, Abba, Father, it is that spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So it's like eternally... The Son is, the, the, it's like eternally, the Spirit is returning the call, is answering the call of the Father by saying, Father, and therefore creating the Son. I think that's part of the idea behind the Father begets the Son in the Spirit, because the Spirit is answering the call of the Father. That's speculation. She doesn't spell that out exactly. That's just my idea. In any case, when you pray, you're entering into that dialogue of God with God. You're entering into this thing. What you're talking about when you cry Father in that way is not a human Father. It's a Trinitarian Father. It's a divine Father. So Aquinas makes a distinction between two different ways you can talk about God. Analogy and metaphor. Is the last big concept of the day. An algae and metaphor. Metaphors are things like God is a rock. They're kind of obviously wrong, but they still have some truth to them. God is a rock. Okay, sure. God is a drunk man. Maybe. It depends. The Old Testament does say that. Uh, that's a metaphor. It's very clearly wrong, right? They're the first things we can negate. Analogies are different. Analogies are things that are true, they're said appropriately of God. The Latin for this is, which she uses in that section of the chapter, is procreate. 
All metaphors are used inappropriately of God, but analogies are used appropriately, appropriately of God. They're true in a real sense. Note that analogies still don't tell you exactly what you're talking about. We talked about this with Thomas Aquinas. Uh, when we say that God is good, we don't mean that God is good like we're good. We mean that God is good in a way that is similar to the way that we're good, to our created understanding of good. God's goodness is analogous to our goodness. And that gives us some information, right? Enough information to know that God is good rather than evil. But that doesn't give us enough information to make God a thing just like us. It allows for you to talk about God and also state that when you talk about God, you don't know what you're saying. You end up saying things about God and not knowing exactly what they mean. Well, you don't know what they mean at all. You might know what they're not. To be able to say God is good is to say that is to know that God is not evil. But it's not to say that you comprehend what God's goodness actually is. These are the only two ways to talk about God. Metaphors and analogies. Because God is bigger than all of our words. Thomas says that most of the time when we call God a father, we mean it metaphorically. Like on the same level as saying God is a rock. In that sense, we are not, to say that God is a father is um, inappropriate. You can say it, but it's just on the same sort of level of truth as to say God is a rock or God is a drunk man. To say that God is father, though, when you're referring to the person of the Trinity that Jesus called father is an analogy, though, he says. So remember, Coakley says that I'm in the Lord's Prayer, Say, our Father who art in heaven, we are using Father metaphorically. I don't actually know that that's true. Um, there are different ways to read the Lord's Prayer. I don't actually know that that's true, but that's what she says. When we refer to the first person of the Trinity, though, as Father, we are using an analogy. And that is appropriate of God. So it's a stronger claim. But we don't know what that fatherhood actually is. That fatherhood might be similar. Well, it is similar to our fatherhood, but it is not to be confused with our fatherhood. That's the way the analogy works. Just like with good, right? God's goodness is similar to our goodness, but it is also dissimilar to our goodness. And the belief is that it is more dissimilar to our goodness than it is similar to our goodness. And so you protect the transcendence of God above anything that we say. The same thing goes for father. God's fatherhood is similar to our fatherhood, but God's fatherhood is more dissimilar to our fatherhood than it is similar to it. That's how she's able to say, the language of fatherhood is appropriate intertrinitarianly, and that means that the true meaning of father is to be found in the trinity not dredged up from the scummy realm of human patriarchal fatherhood. As Jesus himself insisted so evocatively, call no man father except God alone. From Matthew 23. So, she goes on to say that there is no easy way out of the trouble of calling God father. Uh, she talks about the tipex, um, the whiteout approach to liturgy which would just kind of, you know, just white out father-son language just everywhere, and you kind of get rid of it. We have, good, we have examples of this within our church. Um, she says that, that that's one way to do it, but she doesn't think it's actually going to be effective. Because what you're going to end up doing is you will end up, um, you will end up getting something like those artistic depictions of the Trinity, where they say, we're not talking about a man, we're not talking about a man, we're not talking about a man, but it's still two men and a bird. It doesn't actually purge your imagination of what you think fatherhood is. Even if you don't say father, even if you just say creator, we unconsciously associate creator with fatherhood, and so we still might imagine a man sitting on a cloud. The, tr the real trouble, the real fight against idolatry to be fought is against the idea that the first person of the Trinity is a man sitting on a cloud. That's what she wants to get to. There are two strategies that she gives which relate to the metaphor father and the analogy father for how to combat this idolatry. When we're talking about the metaphor, Father, we can feel free to conjoin that metaphor 
with all sorts of zany images for God. You could call God a motherly father, fatherly mother. You could call God a mother and a father. You could mix up the pronouns like I was doing a moment ago, where I was saying that there is, there is nothing to the person of the father before she becomes a father. I was using female pronouns any time that I was referring to the father. You could do something like that and play with your imagination. You could also use, oh, you know, you could also have the creative proliferation of non-gender metaphors, right? And conjoin those with gendered metaphors. What does it mean that God the Father is a lamp? Something like that. Um, you, anyway, so she's just calling for a lot of liturgical creativity to kind of, um, kind of release our minds into a space where we no longer think of God as a man sitting on a cloud. That's one option. The zany proliferation of mutually bombarding metaphors. But when we're talking about God as Father analogously, God the Father in the Trinity, as the first person of the Trinity, Copley says you still have to, that's still appropriate of God, and you still have to maintain the traditional usage. But she says that doesn't mean that every, it's, she says it's not just business as usual. You have to remember that the dissimilarity is greater than any similarity. So what you end up doing is you end up saying that God's fatherhood is not determined, is not dredged up from the scummy realm of earthly fatherhood. It is rather that God's fatherhood is the true fatherhood, and it determines everything else. It goes, so the analogy, and this is the way that Thomas Aquinas says all analogies work. They are determined from God down rather than from us up. So when we talk about goodness, what is the really good goodness? God's goodness, not ours. That's what the same thing works for fatherhood. You enter into that, into the mystery of that analogy by praying. Because in prayer, you enter into the dialogue of the Trinitarian persons with each other. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Holy Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, putting us in the position of the Son making us into the sun in some really strong way that she is yet to clarify in this particular volume. You begin to say Father in a way that transcends all of your previous understandings of Father. Your understanding of Father, you, it's like you cry Father in prayer, and your notion of fatherhood, all these unconscious images, positive and negative, are purged. And you are left with you enter into this silence where you're still speaking, but you're also not speaking. This idea that you say things about God and you don't know what they're saying, you just think you don't know what they mean. You do that in prayer when you call God Father in the power of the Spirit. So, she says, What seemed at first like a Trinitarian formula with little life in it, but much traditional patriarchal authority, insidiously associated and imposed, loosens its grip as an external imposition and begins to become a life into which we enter, a Trinitarian life into which we enter. As we enter, our presumptions about fatherhood strangely start to change, and at last we follow Jesus into an exploration of the meaning of fatherhood beyond all human formulations. So can a feminist call God Father, then? One must more truly insist that she, above all, must, for it lies with her alone to do the kneeling work that ultimately slays patriarchy at its root. That is the claim. The claim is that by entering into the, into the contemplative life, by becoming one in the Trinity, by entering into the dialogue of God with God, you enter into this ecstatic set of relations. And you enter into, you travel a royal road of procession with the son, she says, to a father who is beyond all patriarchy. And this in itself is supposed to have a healing and subversive effect on fallen fatherhood. Fallen, yeah, the fallen fatherhood that structures patriarchy in our world. That's the claim. 